Hey everybody, it's Party Elite with an overview of the King and the Warlord DLC for Total War Warhammer. This first video of this mini-series takes a look at the new factions, lords, their abilities, their campaign significance, and their possible tactical strengths and weaknesses. While they are split apart on the campaign map, they can be played under the Greenskin and Dwarf banners, as well as their own banners on the battlefield. If you only care for something specific, look at the description below for chapter bookmarks. First off, we've got Crooked Moon. Led by Skarsnik, they are a goblin-focused faction, and as such, their WA is a little different, calling goblin armies specifically. Apart from that, they also have a unique building chain available at Karak Eight Peaks if successfully able to retake the settlement. Skarsnik is the only available starting lord for Crooked Moon, and he brings with him great melee stats alongside a goblin big boss hero to start, goblin-specific skills, and of course, his pet squig, Gobla. Starting with Night Goblin Fanatics, Night Goblin Squig Hoppers, and an Arachnorok Spider, Skarsnik has a great start, but his reliance on goblin armies and inability to recruit orcs outside of Karak Eight Peaks makes him quite a challenge. On the battlefield, Skarsnik is an armor-piercing, anti-large, poison-dealing melee expert. He has the most HP out of all of his green skin counterparts, and while he can be used on the front lines because of his balanced stats, he might see better use on the flanks first protecting against cavalry with his 30 point bonus versus large, and then helping close down towards the center using poison to support engagements. He can boost melee attack with Wa and melee defense and leadership with stand your ground. He has access to Spite of the Bad Moon, an area based augment that can help shield bearing allies around himself parry missiles. This gives them a plus 48 to missile parry for 17 seconds. Use this in conjunction with his other ability, Trixie Traps, that gives a 24% speed boost, a plus 16 leadership, and a plus 18% charge bonus for 29 seconds, and you have a very interesting pairing. Try to get about a quarter of the way into your enemy's range, then drop Trixie Trap to speed your units up, and use Spite of the Bad Moon to deflect ranged fire as you get closer to the enemy, where they are more accurate. Spite will die out quickly, but Trixie Trap should last long enough to get you into melee combat, negating a lot of the damage you would have faced otherwise. The one item he has access to, Skarsnik's Prodder, is a magic missile that can hit the enemy from 200 meters out, with a great arc to clear your own lines without damaging them. It's great against units with a large explosion that can disrupt formation, break charges, and shatter morale with a good hit. Use Skarsnik to get a good start to your engagements, protecting your units from ranged fire and charging them in quickly cause disruption with the prodder and support the flanks against cavalry, followed by poisonous support to win engagements one at a time. From the free DLC, we have the Bloody Hands, who follow Wurzag the Great Green Prophet, with a focus on savage orcs, high mobility, and monsters. The Wa under Wurzag is also unique, focusing on savage orc armies, and the Bloody Hands also have global recruitment of the Badlands Savage Orc available to them, as a result of their Savage Ways trait. Wurzag himself is a great dancer and a powerful shaman using the lore of the Big Wa. He has access to unique building chains and can also unlock Spleen Ripa, his war boar mount. As the head of the faction, he gives all of his savage orc units a plus 25 charge bonus with a reduction of 50% in upkeep costs for savage orcs in his army as well. He also reduces enemy hero success rates by 50%. And Wurzag starts his campaign with a giant, a unit of savage orcs, and another of savage orc Arar boys. On the battlefield, Wurzag should be restricted to support use. His HP is extremely low, and he is relatively armorless, with a weapon strength that only outdoes the Goblin Great Shaman. Mounting him on Spleen Ripa gives him some more HP with significant boost to armor, speed, and charge bonus, but a massive drop in weapon strength despite the addition of armor piercing. His spells are all from the Big Wa, but his items and abilities make him very interesting. Power of the Wa can be used to improve power recharge rate as long as leadership isn't wavering. War Paint of Wurzag gives a 12% damage resistance bonus to allies within 45 meters, allowing Wurzag to help hold the line. Wurzag's Revenge creates a constant 40% miscast chance on the battlefield, a great tool if you're up against a magic heavy opponent. Remember, a miscast damages HP, so it can help take out a lord or character. Frenzy is a standard ability, as are Arcane Conduit, Foe Seeker, Stand Your Ground, and Wa, but Effigy of the Git which I assume is pronounced Effigy as opposed to Effigy because he's an orc, is a direct damage ability that works great against an individual target to cause a severe amount of damage from a fair distance. Two items in his arsenal include Squiggly Beast to augment power recharge rate and reserves, and Bonewood Staff to increase melee attacks by 16 and give a charge bonus of 18% across the map for 20 seconds. Keep Wurzag safe, in the distance and on a mount, and he can support your lines running back and forth to cast his abilities where necessary. 
use the Bonewood staff to get a good start to your engagements, and keep Warpaint of Wurzag on hand to help maintain that good start. The Night Goblin Warboss isn't available as a campaign starting lord, and is a relatively weak combatant on the battlefield on his own. His stats are low to middling, though he is able to block 55% of incoming missile fire and deals poison damage. When taking him on the field, however, he should be mounted on his Great Cave Squig. It gives him a significant boost in HP, armor, speed, and charge bonus, and also makes his weapon strength anti-infantry and armor piercing. While this puts him in a similar boat as Skarsnik, he lacks the Trixie Trap ability and is better against infantry as opposed to cavalry. This means he would be better spent supporting your center against infantry engagements and using his poison and armor piercing to win essential infantry fights. Clan Angrund, a dwarf clan led by Belagar Ironhammer, is the final new addition. Their big differentiator, compared to the regular dwarf option, are the Angrund Ancestors, powerful ethereal heroes that start at rank 5, each with different starting stats and abilities, helping Belagar take back Karak 8 Peaks. They are a Master Engineer, a Runesmith, and two Thanes, but as I said, are ethereal, with 80% physical resistance, the unbreakable trait, and the ability to cause fear and terror. Belagar himself is a powerful melee fighter, with the Siege Attacker attribute, allowing you to fight sieges without having to wait for siege engines. He starts with Rangers, Dwarf Warriors, and Hammerers, and can build the Ranger Outpost building early on as a Tier 1 structure to recruit more Rangers. Regular Dwarfs have to wait until the Tier 3 structure, Ranger Barracks. Like Skarsnik, he too has access to a unique building chain at Karak 8 Peaks, but suffers a plus 50% upkeep cost until he takes control of 8 Peaks. He also starts with 4 Ancestor heroes as mentioned, and gives a plus 10 leadership in sieges. On the battlefield, Belagar is one of the most powerful Dwarf Lords, heavily armored and shielded with charge defense against all unit types. Use him to hold the line and thwart attackers on foot, but make sure he has some form of anti-large support. If a cavalry unit knocks him away, it will take him a long time to get back to the fighting where he's best. Apart from Foe Seeker, Deadly Onslaught, and Stand Your Ground, he has Mighty Oath Stone, an ability that gives units within 45 meters of him a plus 36 melee defense and charge defense against all unit types for 26 seconds. Snapping this on at the right time means preventing a successful charge from all unit types, allowing you to hold your ground and get a great start to any engagement, taking little to no damage at the start. Revenge Incarnate is an ability that works only on himself, giving Belagar a plus 58 melee attack and plus 36% armor piercing damage, as well as the unbreakable trait. This is great for getting out of a tough situation and for bringing death and destruction to enemy lords and characters alike. Belagar can also carry with him the Hammer of Angrund, giving him a plus 12% charge bonus, plus 12 melee attack, plus 18% weapon damage, and immunity to psychology. This only works when leadership is above 50%, however, so be sure to take good care of Belagar if you intend on spending the 196 gold on it. In a desperate situation, consider pairing this with Revenge Incarnate, as the Unbreakable trait will maintain leadership at 100%, allowing the bonuses to stack and possibly changing the fate of an engagement. The Rune Lord is another capable Dwarf Lord, not available as a starting lord, but a great support unit on the battlefield. His fighting capabilities are lacking, and even on his Anvil of Doom as a mount, he's one of the weakest fighters, but, as I mentioned, his primary role is support. It is best to compare him to a Runesmith. They have similar abilities, though the Rune Lord has 40% magic resistance and a 25% physical resistance, and variants of runes that the Runesmith has. First, a new rune, the Rune of Hearth and Home. This is a constant effect of plus 100% charge resistance and an immunity to psychology in a 45 meter radius. Use this to help avoid flanking maneuvers and prevent the effectiveness of especially powerful charges. The immunity to psychology is also a great piece of support, as faltering lines can be the end of any good dwarven defense. Next, we have the Master Rune of Oath and Steel. Like the Rune of Oath and Steel, except giving a plus 30 to armor in place of plus 15 for 15 seconds within 45 meters. Then there's the Master Rune of Wrath and Ruin. Like the Rune of Wrath and Ruin, except with a 27 second duration as opposed to 10. And finally, we've got the Master Rune of Negation, like the Rune of Negation, except with a 44% damage resistance in place of 22%, but lasting for only 18 seconds as opposed to 24. The Rune Lord also has access to the ability Locus of Power, which gives a plus 15% magic resistance across the board. Finally, the Rune Lord can bring with him a Rune of Stoicism, making himself unbreakable for 25 seconds when used. These are all very interesting additions to the game, both in terms of campaigning and on the battlefield. What are your thoughts? Any particular campaigns or lords you're looking forward to? Any that you're writing off completely? Anything that you're particularly concerned about having to deal with on the battlefield? 
In the next episode, we're going to look at the new units available to both factions, and finally, after that, we're going to look at the new regiments of renown.